Father, we just, we thank you for this day. Keep singing. Don't stop singing. Father, you know our hearts are for this city. You know our hearts are for this nation. God, we know that your heart is for this world to bring those who are in darkness, Father, who are spiritually dead into your marvelous light. So, God, we are coming humbly before your throne this morning and lifting up hands to you to say, God of revival, come to this city. Father, we pray for every church in this city that your word would be proclaimed this morning and every Sunday morning. God, we know that you've already won. But God, you've chosen us to help co-labor with you to reach the lost. And God, we know that you're a, a God of your word. You're a God of covenant. And that whatever you say will come true, will come to pass. So God, we just ask for revival in this city, God. Would you break the spirit of religion in this city? Would you awaken hard hearts, hearts made of stone? Would you soften hearts? Even this morning in this room, even this morning, people watching online, God, would you soften hearts this morning? Would you turn their minds on to your word, Father? Would you change their thinking? Would you awaken them spiritually, God? Come on, let's sing that one more time with every voice in the room, every voice watching online. Come on, he's the God of revival. This morning, awaken hearts and minds to your word this morning. You are the God of revival. You are the good, good Father. We just give you all the praise and glory. You deserve our best, God. You deserve the first fruits of our heart. So come have your way this morning. Come have your way, Holy Spirit. Fix our gaze on you, God. Come on, there's healing in this place today, God. He's healing hearts and minds this morning. Come on, I don't want you to miss this moment. Come on, he's not done. Come on, whatever you've been holding on to, let it go. Surrender it at the foot of the cross this morning. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just ask for your comfort right now. Would you pour out grace in this room? Would you pour out grace in this city, God? We are desperately in need of new mercies this morning. And you are a God of covenant, Lord. And so we know that what your word says is that you give us new mercies every morning. 
so father we just lean into your understanding we we ask for your will to be done in our hearts and our lives and in this city would you come and move in us and through us in jesus precious and holy name you may be seated good morning welcome to celebration welcome online if you're watching this morning my voice is a little little parched i'm going to get a little water before we start here if that's okay this is holy water by the way in case you were wondering well for most of you uh you probably don't know this but I guess it was about 9.30, 9.45, the power just went out in this whole, like, for blocks. We don't know what happened. We heard a transformer went out. And um, so we have been scrambling a little bit to try to get everything working again. <clears throat> Wasn't really sure if we were going to be able to have full church today because our all the power was out. Sycamore's power was out. And I asked, uh, I text uh, Brother Eric at Sycamore, and I said, what are, what are you going to do? He said, well, we may just have one song and pray and go home. And I was like, man, I really don't want to do that, but it may be hard to see my notes in the dark. So thank you, God of Revival, that you did bring the light back in the darkness, literally. Uh, but we have uh, been walking through a series here called First Fruits. And listen, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, online or if you're joining us for the first time this morning my name is Matt I'm the pastor here and before we get into our series I also want to announce that our kids celebrate is also back on this morning so um, Miss Michelle is at the back with the uh, blue celebrate sweatshirt on and uh, you can go with her any kids that are basically over the age of, of nursery so like two years old will be, or a little older than two years old, will be with um, Miss Michelle and Kids Celebrate. All right. So last week, or let me, let me back up. The first week of this series, uh, Pastor BJ talked about or preached about uh, Cain and Abel. And he talked about how uh, Cain's offering was actually rejected from God, but Abel's offering was not. And a lot of that was not because of what they gave. Like, obviously, they gave two different things. Cain gave vegetables, right, from the field, and Abel gave the first um, born of uh, meat, and God rejected Cain's. But he didn't reject it based on the vegetables. This is not a debate on vegetarianism or carnivores, okay? I know some of you are thinking that, but that's not where I'm going. Um, and so... Cain, the reason that his was rejected was because of his heart. It was the attitude of his heart towards God. He gave to God literally half-heartedly. He did not give his best, while Abel is the one that gave his best. And by faith, Abel brought to God a better offering than Cain did. And so what we see here in, in the first series is that Abel gave of his first fruits meaning that he offered to God his very best without hesitation. And so giving our first fruits, if you've never heard that, what that really means is that it's giving of our finances, our time, our gifts, whatever the Lord asks from us. First fruits are about choosing God first, putting God first in our lives. And really what it boils down to is our view of God. How do we view God? Do we have a high view of God or do we have a low view of God? And so some of you may be saying, well, I have a high view of God. And so my question is, and that's good, that's where we should be, but does your life reflect that you have this high view of God? In other words, does what your talk, does your talk match your walk, right? Do we see that play out in our lives? And so last week, I had a passage from 1 Kings, and we talked about the nameless widow who basically was on dire straits. She had a little bit of oil and a little bit of bread, and Elijah came. God directed Elijah to come 
to that area. There was a drought. There was a famine that had been going on. And he said, hey, I need you to get me some water. Oh, and by the way, as you're going, would you please make me some bread? And so she tells Elijah, well, I've only got this little bit of oil. I've only got this little bit of flour left, and I was saving it because I've been out gathering sticks to make a fire, one last fire, because I'm going to make some bread for me and my son, and then after that, we'll probably starve to death. And he said, I understand, but the Lord has told me for you to make this bread for me first before you make it for yourself and for your son. And so by faith, we see that this nameless widow, that's what she does. And God performs a miracle in that after she makes that bread for Elijah, she goes back and lo and behold, there's more flour and there's more oil. And this went on and on and on for many weeks. And so what we see in that example from 1 Kings of last week is that she gave her all. And she gave her best because literally that was all she had left. And so this week, we're going to be talking about a kind of a different subject. And by the way, if you did not get your sermon notes, we have sermon notes, and they look like this. And so if you want some sermon notes, you can raise your hand, and one of our Dream Team members will get that for you. And so this week, we're going to be out of the book of Haggai, okay? Now, some of you that... Maybe you're new to the Bible, you're like, I didn't know that was in there, that book. Well, it is. It's kind of close to the, to the New Testament, if that, that gives you a direction. Um, and there's only three chapters, so it's kind of hard to find. And so I put the whole first chapter of Haggai, because that's really where we're going to be in our message today. And I took the liberty, liberty of bolding and highlighting some of those things in your notes for you because that's just how good I am sometimes. I just like to make sure you know the important parts that we're going to talk about. And you're like, well, I like to highlight my own, own scripture. Maybe so. But I just took that extra step of faith for you, so you, I just bold it out for you. So here we have Haggai. So when we talked about last week in 1 Kings, what had happened, the history or the context behind those verses, is that God's people had begun to intermarry with pagans. They had begun to worship false idols. And so because of that, God had allowed other, um, I guess you could say, kingdoms come in and conquer them and scatter them. And a lot of his people, a lot of the Jewish people, were um, taken over and moved to Babylon. Okay? And so when we come into Haggai here, uh, the king at the time, who is in your notes, Darius, he has told the Jews, hey, you can go back to Jerusalem and you can rebuild your temple. And so God's people, the Jewish people, they go back to Jerusalem to do that. And actually what, what happens is, is almost two years go by before they even relay the foundation of the temple. And so that's kind of where we're going to pick up today. And again, I know this is a lot of scripture to read, but I want you to get the full picture. So it's in your notes. Gabe's going to put it up. Here's what it says. In the second year of Darius the king, six months, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. So they've already been given a commandment uh, through other prophets. Hey, you need to rebuild. God has said, I want you to rebuild my temple. And basically they're saying, well, look, it's not time yet. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet, and here's what he said. It, is it a time for yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you, have ne but you never have enough. 
You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them in a bag with holes. So right away, God's trying to give us a picture here of what these people have been doing and actually what God has been doing because of their ways. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. That's the second time he says that. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my own house that lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I've called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth on man and beast and all their labors. So I'm going to pause right there. And I want to pray, and then I want to get into this. So Father, once again, I just thank you for your word. God, I pray that you would open hearts, that you would open minds to your word this morning, that it would fall on fertile ground, that you would use me, Father, to preach and to teach your word without error. Holy Spirit, just give me the words you would have me speak. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So my question this morning that I want to start with is, have you ever stood in front of a vending machine with your last dollar, really hangry, anticipating, you know, that manna from heaven, that Reese's cup that you, you just put that dollar in, right? And you're like, this is going to be so satisfying, I can already taste it. And you put it in, and you push the button, and it goes, right? And then it's just hanging there. And then you're like, no, right? I'm sure that's happened to at least a few of you based on the few little pity laughs that you got from me doing that. It has happened to me before, and just to be honest, I did not shake the machine or kick it or hit it. I just walked away sadly in my, my hangriness, and I was like, well, I guess I'm going to continue to be hangry. But you realize in that moment, right, that the machine is out of order. And what we see here in the first chapter of Haggai, and by the way, there's a lot more to this story if you want. The backstory is, is a lot of it is in Ezra, the book of Ezra. And so anyway, God is telling his people, look, like that vending machine, you guys are out of order. Now, I'm not saying y'all are out of order, okay? I mean, you could be. I don't know. It's not for me to judge your hearts. But God is definitely saying in this book of Haggai to his people, look, you're out of order. You have been basically focusing on yourselves instead of rebuilding this temple that I've commanded you to rebuild. And so, basically, God had sent the prophet Haggai to tell God's people, to tell his people, hey, look, y'all are out of order. And so they had returned from Babylon in about 538 B.C. This is like the 6th century. And they began to rebuild the temple two years later, but now, actually, 17 years had gone by since they laid the foundations to the new temple. 17 years, that is, that is a long time, like, my oldest, Caleb, is 18 years old. Like Basically, his whole life so far ha had gone by, and they had not listened to the Lord. They had not rebuilt his temple. And the question is, well, they laid the foundation, which, by the way, it took them two years just to do that before they did it. What, what, why were they not doing this? Well, that's in verses 1 through 11. And if you go back to there, God says, Consider your ways. He says, I've called for a drought on the land. I've called for, I'm sorry, can you put that, go back to verse 11, Gabe. Yeah, maybe, there we go. I've called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, what the ground brings forth on man and beast and all their labors, right? 
And here's, here's what I want us to see here. In verse 8, God is saying, listen, you know, the people do have to work, right? Our, our faith is meant to be an active faith. Maybe you've never heard that from, from me up here, but I've said it many times. But as Christians, we're not meant to just come and sit. We're meant, meant to actually serve. In fact, Jesus told us that on his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. He basically said, and I'm paraphrasing, that if you want to be a leader, then you need to be a servant. And he showed us that from the very beginning, because what did he do? He washed his disciples' feet. Why would he do that? Why would he humble himself to do that? Because he's showing us that we need to serve. We're here to serve, not just serve the Lord of all kings, right? The King of kings. But we're also here to serve each other. We're also here to serve the poor, the widows, and so on and so forth. And so a restored house will bring pleasure and glory to the Lord. That, that's why God wanted them to rebuild the temple. He's like, basically, the temple lying in ruins is a, uh, a picture of my relationship with you. And so I want you to rebuild the temple so I may come and put my presence in the temple and I can have restored relationship with you. You see, a restored temple conveys God's blessing to his people. See, there's work to be done. There's physical work, but also there's heart work to be done. The physical part was in verse 14. Okay, can we bring that up, Gabe? And the Lord... And the Lord, not the Lord. I may have to use that again, though. That's pretty good. I didn't plan that. That's just to make sure that you are all awake and not falling asleep. And the Lord, not the Lord, he stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shethiel, governor of Judah, right? The spirit of Joshua. In other words, he's stirring the heart of his prophets. He's stirring the heart of the remnant of people. And they came and they worked on the house of the Lord. But in verses 5 to 7, God is, is having them consider their ways. What he's asking them to do is, look at your heart. Why have you not rebuilt my temple that I've commanded you to do? He goes on in verse 6 to say, you have sown much, but you've harvested little. You eat a lot, but you never have enough. In fact, you drink, but you never have your fill, and you clothe yourselves, but yet you are not warm. We can, we can uh, at least identify with the warm part this morning because it's really cold out there, right? He says you even earn wages, but you do so in a way that you put your bag, you put your wages in a bag that has holes in it. You see, the people they've been working hard, but their yield has been very little. And so that brings me to point number two in your notes, and that is that God will not bless us if we put our personal comfort before our relationship with Him. And if you missed the first point that I had this morning, it's that as Christians, our faith is meant to be active and not passive. And, and I hate to keep bringing this up, but this is something that that really plagues the Western church. You know, there can be a season, maybe, maybe you've been at another church, maybe you've served somewhere and, and, and there was some pain, there was some hurt there, maybe someone offended you and they were in the wrong, and so you come to a new church, a new faith family, and there may be a time where you just need to sit, you need to receive, you need to do that. But there's seasons for everything. And a lot of times I have people tell me, look, I was, I've been a member of this faith family across town for so many years, but I got hurt there, and this is what happened, and, and I just need to be poured into. And there's nothing wrong with that. But some people stay in that poured into season for years and years and years. And I promise you that you will never find joy if you stay in that season. Because 
We are, as Christians are not meant to be passive. We are literally built to serve, to love, and to reach those around us. It's not just three words that we thought sounded good when we started Celebration Church. It's a way of life. It's the vision that God has given this faith family. And technically, I would say every faith family of every Bible-believing church. They may say it differently, but honestly, we're all called to the same life for God. So God has not blessed their crops because of their preference for personal comfort over the rebuilding of the temp temple. And the reality is, it's very easy for us as human beings. I don't care how super spiritual you are or think you are. It's very easy for us as humans to just stay in our little circle of comfort. But that is not what God's called us to do. It's not how he's called us to live and walk out this thing called faith or the good news or the Christian life. In fact, Jesus was good to tell us, hey, if you deny yourself and you die to self, that's what it's going to take for you to follow me. And oh, by the way, you're going to suffer. People will come against you. The world will hate you if you're my disciple because they guess what? They hated me first. And so make no mistake, Jesus from the very beginning says, look, if you're going to follow me, Count the cost. It's not going to be rainbows and butterflies and Reese's and Skittles falling from the heavens. It's going to be hard. People will come against you. People will slander you. People will attack you because you love me. And guess what? They did it to me first. And that hasn't changed. It hasn't stopped. How many times do we put our beliefs on social media and what do people do? They attack it because it doesn't fit their agenda because their agenda, the world's agenda, is to focus on yourself and not the Lord first. And so they've been working really hard but with little to no satisfaction. In other words, they've been putting in overtime, but yet they still don't have the money to pay their bills. And the real reason is because they've been working hard for themselves, all the while putting God last. So what does God do? God evaporates their grain in order to teach them that rebuilding of his house will bring him glory, and essentially that he should come first. He should be our first fruits. And so God's people had been convinced by the culture around them that rebuilding this temple was a waste of their time. That sounds kind of familiar to me, does it not to you? Doesn't our worldly culture teach us that going to church and serving the Lord and serving the poor and, and doing all these things really is just a waste of time? That's what the world wants you to believe. That's what the devil wants you to believe, that we're wasting our life if we worship the King of Kings, if we serve Him, if our faith is active, if we put Him first, if our gaze is constantly on Him, we are wasting our time. That's what the world is teaching, and it was teaching these people in the 6th century the exact same thing. See, the devil's plan hasn't changed. The good news is, is that, A, we know his, his playbook, we know his plays because God's gracious enough to tell us, but number two, we know... Just like we just sang, he's already won. God has already won. We just have to be faithful in what he's called us to do. So God says when they brought the money home, he blew it away. So because of listening to the world, they were now experiencing loss of money, verse 6, unexpected expenses, verse 9, and even a shortage of crops. Verse 10. The next kind of set of verses, 9 through 11, is kind of mind-blowing to me. Can we bring those up, Gabe, starting in verse 9? God is saying to them, You look for much, and behold, it came to little. In other words, 
You've been working really hard. You've been putting in all of this overtime, but yet what do you have to show for it? And when you brought it home, I blew it away. And I love that God asked this question, why? It, it, to me, it was like when I'm reading this passage and studying, it's like, I mean, not in a violent way, but it's like he's just grabbing them and saying, look, wake up. Why would I do this to you? And he gives us the answer, because my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself, or you could say yourself, with their own house. You see, the people, instead of rebuilding the temple, they had decided, look, we're going we're gonna to rebuild our houses first, and then we're going to get them really nicely decorated. We're going to order from Ikea and rooms to room and rooms to go, and we're going to have this place looking nice. They did that for 17 years. 17 years, they denied the Lord. They put him behind them. They, they did not put him first. And so God blew their money away. He called for a drought. And so in contrast, let's look at the book of Malachi chapter 3, if we can put that up, Gabe. We're going to be reading verses 6 through 12. Here's what God says in verse 6. He says, for, the, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Verse 7. From the days of our fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. This is what these people were doing. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Verse 8, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you in your tithes and contributions? You see, during this time, the people had used all that God had given them, all the grain, all the meat, basically all their wages for themselves instead of giving back the portion, instead of giving the sacrifice of first fruits to him like they already knew to do. Verse 9, this is what God said, You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. In verse 10, he says, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Listen, I, I don't know which of you or which not of you here gives your tithes and offering. I, I nev never looked at that. I don't look at that. I probably never will look at that. But God knows. God knows what you're doing. He knows your heart. He knows your mind. He knows you better than any of us know you. In fact, he knows you better than yourself. And so the question is, are you bringing your full tithe into the house of the Lord so that he may bless you? And listen, we're not talking about prosperity. We're not talking about a, a prosperity gospel where you sow a seed and God fills your need, right? Have you heard that saying before? This is not a name it, claim it kind of thing. This is God saying, as my children, as my disciples of, of Christ, this is what I expect from you to give of your first fruits. And, and he gives it even more specific than that, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But in verse 11 here, he says... I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, ripe, says the Lord Almighty. And maybe you're watching online today, maybe you're sitting here today, and maybe you're in a season where you're living paycheck to paycheck. I, I personally know lots of people who, who that is their life. They, they literally live paycheck to paycheck. Or maybe, maybe you've been in a season where you've been working a lot of overtime 
at work, but somehow at the end of the month, you still don't have extra money to pay your bills. And I want you to understand that sometimes that's just the reality of living in a broken world. Okay, those things will happen. But also, I, I'm offering for your consideration this morning, it might be because of this. Maybe you have not been honoring God first in your first fruits. You see, in the Old Testament, we were commanded, God's people were commanded to give a tithe. You know, Pastor BJ talked about that in, in, in the first week of this. And a tithe basically is, is 10%. Now, there's debate, it could be 15, it could be 20, but basically it's a small portion of what God has given us that we return back to his kingdom. And there's a lot of reasons for that. In fact, if, if our people here didn't do that, then I know the power was out earlier, and I did have the thought, Vicki, that you know maybe she didn't pay the bill somehow, but then when everybody's power was out, I was like, oh, okay, we paid our bill. <laughs> but literally, we, we wouldn't have power to even be here, okay? We wouldn't have the, the, the money to have power to run the air or the heat or, or to have coffee or anything, basically. So it's important. Why? Because God uses these things. Look, we wouldn't be able to give money to people that serve around the world as missionaries to bring the gospel to people all around the world that we help support. And it's not just us, it's churches everywhere. And so maybe, maybe you're like some of these people in Haggai that you've been doing all this work, but it just seems like you can never get ahead. And again, I don't want to blame everything on the fact that you may not be tithing or you may not be giving to the Lord your first fruits, but that could be part of the problem. But it's interesting to me that God says that he's responsible for their financial strain that they're facing, that they've been dealing with, that he's the one that brought it about. He says that when they brought the money home, he literally blew it away. I thought about having some fake money up here because, you know, I didn't want to have my real money. I didn't want to have all those hundreds, you know. I'm just kidding. I don't carry hundreds. But I, I didn't want to, I, you know, I thought about turning on a fan. I'm like, you know. I didn't want to be that preacher because, you know, there was a preacher a week ago. I'm not going to say his name, but he literally spit in his hands, and it was like more than just spit. It was like drainage, and he rubbed it on a dude's eyes, and it was really gross. And um, it caused me to really question that. But uh, you can rest assured, I promise I will never do that here. So in case you're wondering if I'm going to do that, it's not going to happen. Yeah, you can come on up. She's like, I don't know if I want to come up now. But here's the deal. Scripture's really clear to show us that sometimes, maybe a lot of times, God will do things, sometimes things we don't like to get our attention. To You know, like COVID. I'm not saying he brought COVID, but maybe he allowed COVID to help us refocus on what's really important. Do you know, this is not just in our church, but that in most churches, at least, 30% of all attenders on Sunday morning don't go to church anymore. 30%. We've seen that here, but it's not just our church. It's every church that I've talked to around here. It's churches in other states. Why is that? I believe it's because people have taken their eyes off Jesus. They've, they've started to put him behind instead of putting him first. And so sometimes God will get involved in our lives, he'll get involved in our finances, and he blows our money away to get our attention. Why does he do that? He tells us in verse 8 why. He said, so that I may take pleasure in you rebuilding my temple and be honored. In other words, God wants to have a relationship with us where we put him first. 
He demands it. Why? Because that's best for us, but also because it glorifies Him. He knows that He created us to find all of our pleasures and all of our satisfaction in Him for all eternity. And that includes this side of heaven as well as the other. So my last point that I want you to see here in the notes is that God wants this relationship with us where we honor Him by putting Him first and giving our absolute best. And so for 17 years, these people had taken all the resources that God had given them and they had put it on themselves. They had redecorated their homes. They would rebuilt their homes first instead of honoring God first. And even though they had put these other things before God, God still encourages them in verse 13. And I, I bolded it for you. And he says, I am with you, declares the Lord. And here's the good news is that even when we go off track, God is still helping us, guiding us to get us back into alignment with his will. Maybe you're sitting here today, maybe you're watching online today, and God is using this story in Haggai to remind you that, hey, you're not on track. My eyes, your eyes are not focusing on the one who created you. Maybe you haven't been giving your your first fruits to the Lord. I don't know. I don't know your heart that God does. Listen, there's a couple verses that are in your notes here that I wanted to save for last because this has been on my heart for literally almost seven years. So not only are we commanded to give our first fruits to the Lord, but in 1 Corinthians 9.14, this is what it says. It says, In the same way the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. 1 Timothy 5.17 says it this way, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. And lastly, in the the Old Testament, in Ezekiel 44.30, it says, And the first of all the firstfruits of all kinds, And every offering of all kinds from all your offerings shall belong to the priest. You shall also give to the priest the first of your dough, that a blessing may rest on your house. So here's here's what's been on my heart for almost seven years. And most of you may or may not know this, but we don't have any paid staff here at Celebration Church. And if you're new to the gospel, most churches at least in the West, they have paid staff. And listen, I'm not asking you to give for, my, for me. I don't, I don't need a salary. But I believe that if we're going to grow, if we're going to be able to love and serve and reach this city, we need some full-time pastors in this house. And God knows that because God commanded us to give That's one of the reasons why we give back to the Lord. So the people that do preach the gospel, that do this full time, that they can make their living serving the Lord, preaching the word. We need a campus pastor. We need a worship pastor. We need a youth pastor that this is what they do full time. There's so many times that honestly I lay in bed at night and I feel guilty because I'm like, Lord, I feel like we're not even as faithful as we could be to our, our, our faith family because we can't be there full time. And so for almost seven years, I work a full time job and this is a full time job and I'm okay doing that, but I don't think that's going to last long term. We need some people here full time. There's been many people that have wanted pastors that have wanted to come serve here but they have to support their family right and I can't pay them because most of our funds just so you know and anytime you want to see a budget we do it every quarter 
We put it out. In fact, Victoria is over that. If you have any questions, we put all of it out there for you to see. Most of what we bring in in tithes and offerings, honestly, a lot of it goes to um, just paying the rent, paying the power, paying the paying um, to help people that come in every Sunday saying, hey, I need some food, I need some gas money. And then the rest of it goes to help serve missionaries around the world. And so I, I'm asking you humbly, listen, I, I will continue to do this without pay. I don't want pay. But, but I'm telling you honestly, I'm being real, we, we need help. In fact, we don't just need help from pastors, but we need help from all of you as well. See, God didn't just ask for us to give just our money. In fact, really, it's His anyway. He gives us everything. The last scripture I put there was actually from week one, Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. It's all His. The food that you have in your fridge, the food that you have in your pantry, the gas in your car, the, sh the clothes that you have on today, He gave those to you. And all God is asking is that you give a little back so that we can reach the world with the gospel. It's not about how much you give. See, sometimes the enemy says, well, you know, you're only giving $3. And we know from the word that, look at the widow. She gave all that she had, but he's not even asking us to give all that we have. You give with what you can. You give with a joyful heart. Why? Because the Lord deserves it. And I'm just worried that if we continue down this road of not having pastors that are here full time, that we may eventually just fade out. And, and I don't believe that is God's plan for us. I believe that possibly we've experienced some hardship here and we haven't reached the city like we want to because maybe as a faith family, corporately, we haven't been grounded in these principles of giving, not just of our money, but of our time, of our gifts and our talents. The Holy Spirit has given us all gifts. Some people he's given the gift of, uh, of singing or the gift of playing an instrument or the gift of administration or the gift of intercessory prayer or of helps or of mercy. There's so many gifts. And those gifts are meant for us to use in the body of Christ. So that's why I believe that this message from Haggai is a now word, not just for our church, faith family, but for every church in the West. Because, see, I think that one of the problems that we have as a faith family in the West is that we have focused on me, myself, and I. We, we've let the culture of the world infiltrate our minds and our hearts, and we've been focusing on ourselves first when we should be focusing on God first. Remember last week, I said this relationship, this vertical relationship between me and the Lord, between you and the Lord has to be first. Otherwise, all the horizontal relationships that we have will be out of balance, will be out of kilter, and we will waste all of our time trying to fix the balance of this when the cure, the cause of it, is this, the vertical relationship. And so I'm asking, if you're watching online, if you're here today, that you seriously pray and ask the Lord, Lord, if I haven't been giving my first fruits to you, first I repent. I ask forgiveness. And then I'll, I would say this, just like in Malachi, the Lord said what? He said, put me to the test. If you have never tithed a day in your life, I would just repeat what the Lord said, put me to the test. For the next 30 days, or however long you want to do it, Start to give to the Lord. It doesn't have to be this ministry. It could be another ministry. See what happens. See if your money keeps getting blown away or if 
somehow, miraculously, all this overtime, all this pay to pay, paycheck to paycheck stuff starts to get erased. Start to come and give of your talents, of your giftings that the Lord has given you. and See what happens. See if He doesn't bless your heart and remind you of the joy of your salvation. So I believe that this is something that's vitally important to us. That we really take heart what God has brought to us today through this series. We still have one more part next week. But I don't want us to be guilty of focusing for seven years or 17 years on ourselves when we should be putting God first. So I'm going to ask that you stand. Betsy and Justin are going to lead us in response this morning. Just ask the Lord to search your heart. And if there's any way that you've been not putting God first, would you ask Him to, to help you in that, to direct you, to guide you, that you would be in His will? Would you lead us, Betsy?
of all your love this morning. I just thank you for your word this morning. God, it's, it's not my, my job to convince or condemn. And God, I pray that I have not condemned in any way this morning. And God, it's the work of your word working in our hearts and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would take what you have given us today in your word, God. I pray that you would just let it rest on our hearts and our minds, that it would be active. Because, Father, we know that your word is, is sharper than any two-edged sword, that it's living, that it's active. And so, God, I pray that people would leave here today and not forget your word, that they would, they would chew on it, God, that they would meditate on it, that they would taste and see that you are good. Father, I pray for the offerings today, God. I pray for the tithes today, that, that you would take it, that you would multiply it. But God, I pray that you would do it in such a way that it would bring glory to you, that you would receive all the credit from it. Father, I thank you for your mercy and your love and your grace. We thank you, Jesus, that you came and that you lived a life that we couldn't live. You gave your life willingly to restore that vertical relationship with us. So, Father, I just pray that you would have your way on us, in us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, I have just a few quick announcements before you leave. Uh, don't forget, uh, 24 hours of prayer is going to be this Friday. That's something that we're going to do at our homes because it'll be from the early morning, from like 8 a.m. to 7 a.m. the next day. We still have a lot of open spots uh, in, the, in hours for people to pray. But I also want to remind you about 21 days of prayer, that from 6.30 to 7.30 next week is the last week, okay, that we'll be doing that. We open up the church for us to come and pray as a faith family together from 6.30 to 7.30. Also, Wednesday... The women's discipleship group, study group, will be starting from 7 to 8 o'clock. Is that right, Michelle? Okay, good. She's giving me the nod, yes. Uh, also, youth, uh, we're going to do it 7 to 8 as well. So we'll just make it real easy for the parents uh, to drop the kids, the youth off, and also be doing that during the women's Bible study. Next Sunday is our eat and greet potluck. We have a sign-up for that. I know we have a sign-up for everything I'm going to change our name from Celebration Church to the Church of Signups, in case you were wondering, not really. But bring whatever you your favorite dish that will feed four to five people, maybe six people. And I look forward to us sitting down and having a meal together and fellowship. Have a great rest of the day. Love you all. Be blessed.